no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and don't forget we have Academy gear available. We appreciate you. Last lesson, we focused on what went right with the full Starship launch. Today, we will focus on what went wrong. The Starship has 33 Raptor 2 rocket engines. These engines are produced in-house by SpaceX in high volume. Over the years, they have steadily increased in power and dependability. Rocket engines are built to control a continuous explosion, allowing exhaust products to exit at supersonic velocities. This exhaust generates a tremendous amount of impact force, heat, and vibration. The effects of rocket engine exhaust on concrete have been known for well over half a century. SpaceX had wanted to use bare refractory concrete for their launch pad. Let's see how this worked out for them. As we can see, huge chunks of concrete and over 100 tons of dirt were thrown in every direction. Let's take a hard look at how this happened and how SpaceX might fix this problem. One of the problems with rocket engines is the sound waves produced. Sound waves are longitudinal waves created when an object vibrates and produces pressure waves that travel through air or another medium like water, metal, or concrete. Particles of the medium vibrate back and forth in the direction of the wave. This creates areas of high pressure and low pressure in a gas medium. The high pressure regions are called compressions and the low pressure regions are called rarefactions. These pressure waves travel through the medium in all directions, away from the source of the sound. And they propagate through the medium at a speed defined by the composition and conditions of the medium. In air, at standard temperature and pressure, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. As sound waves propagate through the air, they cause the air particles to vibrate back and forth in the direction of the wave. The particles in the compressions are pushed closer together, while the particles in the rarefactions are pulled farther apart. This creates the series of compressions and rarefactions that propagate through the air and eventually reach our ears, or the concrete of our launch pad. When the sound waves reach our ears, they cause our eardrums to vibrate, which in turn causes small bones in our inner ear to vibrate, and these vibrations are then transformed into electrical signals that are sent to the brain, for they are interpreted as sound. Sound waves are measured in decibels. The decibel scale is logarithmic, meaning it is exponential. Each level increase is ten times stronger than the one before it. The decibel scale starts at a reference level based on the threshold of human hearing, about 1,000 hertz. A hertz is a cycle per second, so 1,000 cycles or waves per second. This is defined as zero decibels. 60 decibels is 10 times more intense than 50 decibels, and 100 times more intense than 40 decibels. 120 decibels is 1,000 times more intense than 90 decibels. A decibel level of 120 is like a chainsaw fully revved three feet from your ear. A nearby lightning storm, or a jet engine at power 30 meters away from you. This can cause immediate and permanent ear damage. The Saturn V rocket had a sound level of 204 decibels at a distance of 100 meters. The sound level of the SpaceX Super Heavy booster has been estimated to be even higher. When sound waves encounter an object, they can cause it to vibrate at the same frequency as the sound waves. If the sound waves are powerful enough, the vibrations can become intense and cause damage to the object. Concrete is a solid material made up of cement, water, and aggregates such as sand and gravel. 
The strength of concrete depends on the properties of its components and the way they are combined. When sound waves pass through concrete, they cause the aggregates and other components to vibrate. This can lead to the formation of microcracks and can weaken the concrete structure. If the sound waves are strong enough, they can cause the microcracks to expand and merge, leading to visible cracks in the concrete. These cracks can grow and compromise the integrity of the structure, making it more susceptible to further damage. Sound waves can also cause cavitation in the water contained in the concrete. Cavitation is the formation and collapse of small bubbles in a liquid due to changes in pressure. When sound waves pass through water, they create regions of low pressure that can cause water to vaporize and form these bubbles. When the sound wave passes, the bubbles collapse, causing shock waves that can further damage the concrete. These shock waves can be powerful enough to create visible light in a phenomenon called sonoluminescence. Sound waves will also reflect off the ground and launch structures, and these will impact the rocket itself and cause it to vibrate. This vibration can cause damage to the rocket. In addition, rocket engine exhaust is very hot. The temperature inside a rocket engine can be as high as 3,600 degrees Celsius. The exhaust cools as it leaves the nozzle and continues to cool as it moves away from the engine. But it is still very hot when it impacts the landing pad. This heat is also a problem for concrete, as it causes the materials in the concrete to expand and can cause fractures to form. There is also water in concrete, as we said, and it only takes a temperature of 100 Celsius to boil water. The exhaust is still thousands of degrees above this. The water in the concrete flashes to steam. This creates high pressure explosions in the concrete, causing cracks to form and chunks of concrete to start breaking away. When chunks of a material like concrete break away from a surface due to heat, pressure, or stress, we call that spalling. High velocity exhaust gases can also erode the surface of the concrete. This erosion is caused by the mechanical impact of the exhaust gases on the surface of the concrete, as well as the chemical reactions that occur between the hot gases and the concrete. SpaceX used a special low water content extra hard concrete called refractory concrete. One of the specific brands was called Martite. It was a chunk of Martite that damaged a Raptor engine on a previous static fire. An even stronger type of refractory concrete was used in the repairs. This was called Fondag. This concrete had more aluminum in it to provide further strengthening and even less water. And it had stood up pretty well to test fires at 40% power. SpaceX thought that the new version would be strong enough to survive a full power launch. And they were wrong. When the 33 Raptor engines were throttled to almost full power, the impact of the exhaust eroded the surface of the concrete and heated the concrete, causing cracks to form, producing spalling. Then chunks of flying concrete immediately took out up to three Raptor engines. This loss of power caused the other engines to work harder and left the rocket blasting the launch pad from close proximity for longer. This combination obliterated the launch pad, throwing hundreds of tons of dirt and concrete into the air, allowing this debris to hit the Starship causing further damage, including to the hydraulic system used to vector the thrust of the engines, crippling the Starship before it even got into the air, and possibly puncturing the oxygen tank. I think this is why the oxidizer was depleted much faster than the methane fuel, but I could be wrong. Leaking oxygen does not cause an explosion, by the way, and if it was low on the tank, or the oxygen is still liquid, it would not cause a rapid depressurization. So Starship was doomed before it even left stage zero with the loss of three engines causing a 9% loss of thrust before the ship was even released from the hold-down clamps. This is the first real self-inflicted failure I have seen SpaceX commit. Now let's look at how they can fix this problem and be launching again within 120 days. Rule 1. The Starship is very heavy and does not have a high margin on its thrust-to-weight ratio at launch. Do everything possible to avoid engine loss on liftoff. Rule 2. SpaceX had decided to go without a water deluge system, as it was not yet ready. Water deluge systems have several functions. The water works for fire suppression, so you don't set fire to things on the tower or ground. And this water quickly evaporates, cooling the launch pad. These are the two main functions of a rocket water deluge system. But as an added bonus, 
the steam produced builds up around the launch pad, creating a barrier between the rocket and the surrounding environment. Water acts as a sound absorber, dampening the sounds produced by the rocket. Sound waves can be very destructive, and NASA used various methods to mitigate the effects of sound waves generated by the Saturn V rocket during liftoff. The sound waves produced by the rocket engines were not only very loud, they also had the potential to cause structural damage to the launch platform and nearby facilities. One of the methods used was to moderate the sound waves with the construction of a sound suppression system, which consisted of large water tanks surrounding the launch pad. During launch, the water was released from the tanks and sprayed onto the launch pad in a controlled manner. This helped to absorb and dissipate the intense sound waves generated by the rocket engines, and was separate from the deluge system itself which is used to cool the exhaust before it hits the launch pad, and to cool the launch pad itself. The water sound suppression system reduced the sound level at the launch pad and surrounding areas, and also protected the launch platform and other infrastructure from damage. Rule 3. Build a strong flame diverter. SpaceX just used the ground itself, which is perpendicular to the flow of the exhaust. A flame diverter that is perpendicular to exhaust flow can bounce the exhaust right back up at the base of the rocket, carrying any debris with it. To prevent this, most large rocket systems use a more effective flame diverter that redirects the flow of exhaust gas from vertical to horizontal. This diverter must be able to survive the force of the rocket's engines and the heat transmitted to it. To mitigate the effects of the heat generated by the rocket engine exhaust, special materials and coatings are used to protect concrete surfaces so they can withstand the high temperatures and erosive force of the exhaust gases. The Apollo Saturn V flame diverter was designed to redirect the flames and exhaust gases generated by the rocket engines away from the launch pad and surrounding facilities. Construction of the flame diverter began in 1965 and took several years to complete. The structure consisted of a series of concrete blocks that were arranged in a curved shape to deflect the rocket exhaust away from the launch pad. The blocks were reinforced with steel to withstand the intense heat and pressure. The need for this steel reinforcement should have been obvious to SpaceX. It's not like they don't have enough steel lying around. Another key challenge faced during the construction of the NASA flame diverter was ensuring that it was able to withstand the powerful vibrations generated by the Saturn V rocket engines during liftoff. To address this, the structure was designed to be flexible and able to absorb the vibrations without being damaged. The steel reinforcement was critical to this flexibility. After construction was completed, the flame diverter was extensively tested to ensure that it would perform as intended during a launch. This involved simulating the conditions of a liftoff and measuring the temperature and pressure at various points around the launch pad. The results of these tests were used to refine the design of the flame diverter and ensure that it was able to provide adequate protection. During the Apollo program, the flame diverter was used to launch a total of 13 Saturn V rockets, including the historic Apollo 11 mission that first landed humans on the moon. That flame diverter survived all of this and can still be seen today, remaining an important piece of spaceflight history and serves as a reminder of the incredible achievements of the Apollo program. NASA 13, SpaceX 0. The Soviets had to deal with these same problems. The Baikonur Cosmodrome is a spaceport located in Kazakhstan that was originally built by the Soviet Union in the late 1950s. It has been used to launch a variety of spacecraft and is currently operated by the Russian Federal Space Agency, also called Roscosmos. The flame diverter at the Baikonur Cosmodrome is a critical component of the launch infrastructure and helps to ensure the safety of both the launch vehicle and the surrounding area. The Baikonur flame diverter is essentially a large concrete structure that is positioned beneath the launch vehicle during liftoff. Construction of the flame diverter began in 1963 and took several years to complete. The structure consists of a series of concrete blocks that are arranged in a curved shape to deflect the rocket exhaust away from the pad. The blocks are reinforced with steel to withstand the intense heat and pressure generated by the rocket engines during liftoff. Does this sound familiar? At Baikonur, the bottom of the flame trench is approximately 14.5 meters below the surface of the launch pad. These depths are necessary to ensure that the rocket exhaust is properly deflected and does not cause damage to the launch pad or surrounding infrastructure. Soyuz and Proton rockets are still launched from this structure today. Here you can see the scale of this system. Many people have compared the failure of the N-1 program with the failure of the first Starship test launch. I don't think that's fair. 
The N-1 was not beaten to death by high-speed boulders before launch. The N-1 rocket was, in fact, launched from a separate launch complex at Baikonur, known as Site-110. The launch pad used for the N-1 rocket had a unique flame deflector system, which consisted of a series of large concrete plates that were arranged in a circular pattern around the base of the rocket. This allowed for easy replacement and maintenance in the event of damage. The flame diverter worked fine during testing of the N-1, but other problems, described in this lesson, caused the cancellation of the N-1 program in 1974. The flame diverter of Site 110 has survived until today and can be seen at the Baikonur Launch Complex. The Space Shuttle program also used a flame diverter, of course. Construction of this flame diverter began in the early 1970s and again consisted of a series of concrete blocks arranged in a curved shape and reinforced with steel. It's not like these solutions were a state secret. The flame deflector system for shuttle included an inverted V-shaped steel structure and refractory bricks covered with high temperature concrete material five inches thick. This extended across the center of the flame trench and was again protected by steel. One side of the V received and deflected the flames from the main engines, while the opposite side deflected the flames from the solid rocket boosters. There were two movable deflectors at the top of the trench to provide additional protection to hardware from the SRB plumes. That trench was 490 feet long, 58 feet wide, and 42 feet deep. Are all my Imperial friends happy? This system was modified for the SLS, receiving an additional 93,000 refractory bricks and the addition of a large ignition overpressure sound suppression manifold pipe, seen here. The SLS was designed to be more powerful than any other rocket currently in operation and required a new launch tower and a flame diverter capable of handling the increased thrust and exhaust velocity. The SLS launch tower stands at approximately 98 meters tall and was designed to provide the necessary infrastructure to support the SLS rocket during launch. The tower is located at Launch Complex 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and consists of several different levels and platforms. The first level of the tower is the blast pad, which serves as the base for the flame diverter. The upper levels of the tower are used to house various support systems and equipment for the launch vehicle. These include the access arm, which is used to provide personnel with access to the launch vehicle, the environmental control system, which regulates the temperature and humidity levels around the launch vehicle, and the emergency evacuation system, which is designed to quickly get personnel to safety in the event of an emergency. The design of the SLS launch tower and flame diverter was based on previous launch infrastructure designs, such as those used during the Apollo and Space Shuttle programs. However, several modifications were made to accommodate the unique requirements of the SLS rocket. One of the key challenges faced during the construction of the SLS tower and flame diverter was ensuring that they were able to withstand the powerful vibrations generated by SLS during liftoff. To address this, the structure was designed to be flexible and able to absorb the vibrations without being damaged. Construction of the SLS launch tower and flame diverter began in about 2014 and took several years to complete. The flame diverter for the space launch system consists of a series of rectangular concrete blocks that are arranged in a curved shape. Each block has dimensions of approximately 3 meters by 3 meters by 1.5 meters. The blocks are reinforced with steel. And there's also a flame trench. The trench system is used to channel the exhaust gases away from the launch pad and surrounding area, and is designed to be deep enough to prevent the exhaust gases from being blown back onto the launch pad. During the first launch of the SLS for the Artemis 1 mission, some damage to the tower and launch pad was reported. Damage included discoloration and peeling of paint on the pad two cameras that were rendered inoperable, and a pair of elevator doors were blown out by the intense pressure at launch. Compare that to boulder-sized chunks of concrete, damaging the nearby support tanks and even vehicles hundreds of meters away. SpaceX made a bad judgment call when they launched with bare concrete, but I still consider the launch a success, because despite this incredibly difficult launch, the Starship itself was able to clear the launch tower and climb to an altitude of 48 kilometers. The fatal injuries to Starship were self-inflicted by SpaceX. How will SpaceX rectify this problem? Elon Musk has already said that a protective steel structure will be built over the concrete and that the structure will be water-cooled and is an excellent idea, especially if they vent the steam produced around the launch structure, helping to absorb dust and dampen sound waves. 
SpaceX has also announced that it will repair the launch pad and be ready to try again within two months. I think that Starbase will be repaired and capable of another Starship launch in about 120 days. And I think it will take at least that long to get the FAA to calm down. And before we go, a lot of people thought I was confused about the flip separation. I don't think I am. The booster is supposed to shut down its engines, at which point the Starship will start to decouple. I have been told that there is no latching mechanism to hold it down, but I find this very hard to believe, considering that it stayed attached during these crazy flips. After main engine cutoff, the Starship is supposed to be released, and the booster will then fire its RCS thrusters to flip it around for its return flight. This is supposed to gently push the Starship away obviating the need for a more complicated system. This might have worked fine, under other circumstances, but the Starship booster never climbed to the correct altitude or velocity for separation. It spun out of control, and the Starship stayed attached. And this is something else that I think was a complete failure. I think the Starship should have been configured for an in-flight abort. The booster had already been fatally damaged by the launch pad failure. If the Starship had flown itself to safety, coming back to land sedately on the pad when the booster failed to reach altitude, the flight would have been a resounding success, proving that Starship can save itself if anything goes wrong. By the way, your homework this week is to watch this video by Marcus House. He does a great job of describing the Starship launch tower and stage zero. Thanks for watching, and stay safe. Ad Astro Proterra.